All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our recording of our Living with Songbirds program. Um, this is not the live recording. Unfortunately, we had an error with that. So you won't be able to hear any of the questions or anything else that were addressed during the program. However, if you have them, please feel free to leave a comment on the video or you can contact me. My contact information should be at the end of the presentation. So why don't we go ahead and dive in with Living with Songbirds and let's ask a few questions. So first off, of course, I would ask, what is a songbird? So I've got the advantage that I live in a tree city and I get to enjoy the presence of songbirds all over where I live. I have several that visit my yards and it was kind of the inspiration for me wanting to do this program and learn a little bit more about these birds that I see everywhere. Now, while a lot of us will just think that any bird that's uh, making any kind of nice sound is probably going to be a songbird, there actually is a somewhat tighter, tighter definition that we can use. Now, ornithologists are going to, to refer to songbirds as ossines. This is a suborder within the order of birds known as passerines. So that means that all songbirds are going to belong to the order of passerines, but not all passerines are going to be songbirds. Now, the things that set them apart are going to be a very specific toe arrangement, which we're going to talk about here momentarily, as well as the way songbirds learn their music. Unlike other birds, they are born with a template of a song, and then they develop their full song as they get older. And we're going to talk about this a little more later. However, the song that they develop may not necessarily be bird song. It could be made of sounds that they hear in their environment, which can get kind of interesting depending on how urban you are. So first diving into this toe arrangement here, what we're going to see is that songbirds have a very, very specific one, and it has a specific design intention behind it. And you can actually see that displayed by this little guy on the screen right now. What it is, is that they are, have a toe arrangement where there are three toes positioned in the front and one in the back. And that organization is intended for grasping onto branches or wherever they're going to perch or roost. The arrangement is known as anisodactyl, and it provides a high amount of stability on branches and lots of different perching locations. This is why when we see bad weather coming in, we can see groups of birds roosting because their feet are designed to hold on very tightly and provide a great deal of stability on whatever they're sitting on. And also the rear toe that's a part of this foot assembly is known as a hallux. And we're going to see a little bit of a design right here. So obviously I can't take credit for these images. You can see one of them is actually from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, however, it does show you what that toe arrangement looks like. You can see here on the titmouse and nuthatch, et cetera, that they have those three toes in front and one in the back. And then in the side image, you could see what it's actually intended to do. You can see that that bird is able to hold on very easily to some kind of thorny, what, what is probably a, a rose cane during its dormant season. So that way they can hold on, they can avoid issues and stand on branches and canes without a whole lot of difficulty. Now, as we keep moving through a lot of their body design, it's important to talk about their feather arrangement. Their feather arrangement is not only gonna create their plumage and allow flight, but those colors are also going to help them find mates and in the case of us birders, help identify our birds pretty easily. But those feathers come up from specific areas, kind of like how we develop hair on our head. So what the feathers are going to do is they're going to develop along a feather tract that's on the body. And this tract is going to be filled with tiny little spots known as terrily, where the feathers will actually grow out of them. And then the feathers will grow to cover the rest of the body to provide uh, defense against the environment and, of course, the feathers they need for flight. The arrangement, like I said, is useful for color, the plumage arrangement. Uh, it's ideal for attracting mates, uh, showing warning colors, things like that. And it also helps us, of course, in identification. Now, this image shows kind of where those feather tracks are. What you're looking at is a robin species, I believe. And you're seeing the feather track from the dorsal view. And that means you are looking from the top down. You're seeing the bird's back. You can see those feather tracks are not just all over the place. They actually cover very specific areas where those feathers will grow and develop out of. And there's something similar on the, on the lower portion of the body, the ventral side of it too. But this image is great because you can see exactly where the pinions are growing in, where all the other feathers are going to be. And it just gives you an idea of how those feathers are going to develop. If you think about it, look at some of the baby birds that you could see online. You can actually see the little downy feathers beginning to develop on their bodies after they're born. 
So, of course, it's hard to talk about birds without talking about eggs and the young that's associated with those eggs. Now, all of our Ossines have a little bit of a different strategy when it comes to their eggs, and it's really apparent in this picture. Now, most birds are going to have white or near white eggs, some variation of that, whereas passerines can actually have eggs that are different colors. Now, a lot of North American species are going to lay clutches of several eggs, um, but unfortunately, some of them are also going to be brood parasitic. Now, birds outside of passiformes will sometimes lay eggs that are two different colors to be able to deter cuckoos or any kind of nest parasites that might try to take advantage of those areas. The big question that usually comes up when we talk about these eggs are why are they different colors? One great example being, why are the robin's eggs blue, this bright, beautiful blue color? Well, female robins add a pigment known as bill of verdin to the eggs as they are laid. Now, it's believed by the current research that this pigment, the higher the concentration is, it will entice male robins to invest more in taking care of their young, showing that the young are healthier, the female was stronger and able to lay stronger eggs, that kind of thing. Because a lot of our Ossines, males will participate in the rearing of the young, but that can be variable, and they're not going to put in nearly the amount of energy that the female will. Now, the fledglings of passerines are blind, featherless, and they're incapable of taking care of themselves. Imagine the traditional image of the wide open baby bird mouths as mom brings something for them to eat. This means that they are altrical. Now, I put down here that there's altrical versus precocial. Precocial means that the birds that are born actually reach maturity earlier, or at least their ability to find food is gotten to earlier. Uh, some quail species are a great example where the young can actually take off out of the nest and go ahead and find food for themselves. What this means is that passerine parents need to put in a huge amount of time in taking care of their young, so that's a lot of energy that they're devoting in there. Oftentimes, it's both parents doing it. Now, a little bit on our songbird tunes. This is something that I mentioned very briefly earlier. Our songbirds don't develop music, they don't come right out and have music there. They have to develop it over time. So this is unlike a lot of groups of birds. Songbirds are only born with a template of a song. They get their new songs by eavesdropping on the adults as nestlings or learning it from the sounds in their environment. Now, some songbirds will only learn for a very short period of time, and what they get out of it, that's what they use. Whereas other songbirds are going to be learning new songs all their life and have a huge song repertoire compared to their those that don't learn for a long time. The songs, like I said, don't need to come from another songbird. Now, the reason that this is possible is that they have an organ that is very well developed known as the syrinx. Now, almost all birds have this organ. That's how they're able to make sound. That's their voice box, just like what we have. However, the extra musculature in the syrinx of songbirds allows them to produce a much higher variety of sound in different pitches and tones, etc. Now, this can be very, very variable, but it remains apart from all the other taxa or all the other groups of birds that you see out there. Songbirds are the king of making songs, thus their name. Now, you might ask, why do they sing? Well, there are a few reasons behind that. Songs, like pheromones, are intended to convey a message to some, the people in the same species group or outside of it. This helps them establish territory, determine mate quality. They can alert nearby nesting uh, conspecifics to the approach of a predator. They can also attract mates through their song. One thing that's really, really interesting in songbirds, and one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about them so much, was that they have an incredibly high capacity for mimicry as well. So that what you're seeing right here is a mockingbird, and I put on here a new kind of car alarm. You can actually look this up. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find the video for it this time, uh, but you can look up on YouTube videos of mockingbirds who are imitating car alarms. They live in an urban environment, and they've become so adapted to that environment that their songs are actually the alarms of the cars in the neighborhood. Some of them not only do the car alarms, but Imagine you have a vehicle where when you hit the unlock button on your key fob, it makes that double horn sound beep. Well, some of them are also imitating that sound now too, which is just fascinating to hear and kind of tells you exactly how much they've been forced to adapt to the humans 
and live in our environment. So let's go over a few of our common Indiana songbirds. I, this is something that I wanted to do when I've given this program previously, and now I'm going to dig in a little bit to make sure we learn something about the birds that we see outside our doors every day. So we're going to start up with a house finch. A house finch is a very, very common one in the area I live in. Um, I see mated pairs of house finches constantly in my backyard, and I know they're nesting around my home all the time. Now, these are originally native to the Western US, but they, they were illegally caged and sold as pets in New York in the 1940s. They were released when various pet shop owners attempted to avoid prosecution for their crime. So they just opened up their cages and let them loose. And now we have house finches everywhere. Now, these are purely vegetarian birds. The adults feed chicks to a similar diet to what they consume as well. They tend to favor seeds like sunflowers, thistle, and I believe safflower as well. However, house finches have a well-known susceptibility to a type of conjunctivitis that's also called house finch eye disease, where their eyes will become crusty and swollen and sometimes lead to death in, our song, in house finches. So our northern cardinal real quick here. This is one that here in Indiana, we get a lot of northern cardinal. We see these constantly. I see several mated pairs outside my house. There was one I was just looking at yesterday when I was thinking about recording this one. Northern cardinals are fairly ubiquitous. It is our state bird here in Indiana. And six other states also claim it as their state bird. Now, they are sexually dimorphic in their color pattern, which means the males are going to be much brightly colored, like they're the bright red, and females are going to be more duller brown. Sometimes their crest may be smaller or muted, but I think that might just be individual. I would have to double check that a little closer. So Northern Cardinals can also get a mutation where you see unusual color patterns where you'll see blotchy reds, browns, and whites on the birds, regardless of what gender they are. And then our American robin. This is one that we are all very familiar with. We always look for the red-breasted robin as they come out during the spring and get ready to do their nesting activities. Uh, this one, like I said, it's a big indicator of spring. It's the first thing we look for. It is a member of thrush family, th so thrushes are considered songbirds. They're really well known for their blue eggs, and I mentioned earlier how the how blue the eggs are can encourage the male robin to help its young, and the adults will very aggressively defend their nests. You'll note that usually in areas where you see songbirds, for those of you who are more used to looking at them, you'll often see red tail hawks and other raptors may come by. So the robins are looking out for those as well as looking out for things like cats. Uh, they are omnivorous. They will feed on insects, earthworms, berries, any kind of plant material that they're able to digest. Uh, and while both parents will feed the young, the female is more invested than the male is. That's the blue egg thing that I was talking about a moment ago. Most of the songs you'll hear are going to be males defending territories and alerting against predators. This doesn't mean that female songbirds don't sing. They can. They can make sound and they might sing a little bit depending on the species and mating ritual, etc. But in robins, at least, the songs are going, a lot of the songs you hear are males defending their territories. Now, I wanted to talk about nesting behaviors for all three of these species, and I noted that they essentially have the same nesting behavior. So what happens is they're going to create a cup-shaped nest made out of twigs, hair, thread, cotton, and honestly, whatever material they think is going to be best suited for creating their nest. In a human environment, you're going to see a lot of materials in there. Usually their nests are going to be positioned lower, so in shrubs or small trees. You can even find them on any ornamentation on your houses. There's a robin's nest on a, something sticking out over my garage, and you can find them on signs or on businesses and things like that. Uh, nesting behaviors and mate choices are usually going to begin in the spring, and then they're going to nest from that point on. You can get up to three broods per season, depending on the season, how much food they have. Um, of course, we've experienced a drought in this last year, so we may not see necessarily as many broods, or if the season is extended enough, we may see broods continue on just a little bit further. Maybe they'll get those, that third brood in. So moving on to some other birds that we see very commonly, sparrows are a big one that a lot of us here in Indiana have grown up with and a lot in other states as well. So first let's look at the house sparrow versus our American tree sparrow. So there is a little bit of a story here. 
our house sparrow is not necessarily native to our area. So house sparrows are actually native to Eurasia and North Africa. They were in, introduced in New York in 1851 as a pet. And then of course they were released due to human clumsiness essentially. They are aggressive and they will closely associate with humans. So they will defend their areas very aggressively, but they're going to be urbanized. Whereas the American tree sparrow is native to North America, but it avoids urban areas and it avoids humans. It nests more northerly, but it is not really that associated with trees. Now, both of these insects, both of these birds, I'm sorry, are going to rely on seeds and insects and keep their foraging low to the ground. So that's why we see them on the ground hopping around looking for seeds or other things to eat. House sparrows are so adapted to the human environment, they're even able to forage on sidewalks and parking lots where we throw away food and other materials that they can gather. Now, when it comes to nesting, there is a little bit of a difference between these species. House sparrows are cavity dwellers, so they can take advantage of a lot of tight spots. They can be located under eaves, on signs, even on top of tra traffic lights or other similar locations. And they're going to be head create nests that are stuffed with coarse vegetation, other material. Now, birds sometimes will nest as groups close to each other, but house sparrows can pretty much stack on top of each other with their nests. They nest very closely together. The nests are often reused by house sparrows, but Unfortunately, they can also forcefully compete with other species for nesting locations, including any nesting boxes you put up. So if you put up a nesting box, you need to make sure that the bird that you want to live there is actually there and hasn't been chased off by a group of house sparrows. But our tree sparrow, it's going to nest closer to the ground and it's going to be away from human habitats. Their nest can go as high up as four feet using like a small tree or a shrub, but they can even take advantage of tussocks of grass on hilly areas to create their nest. Males and females of tree sparrows are gonna pair up in the spring, but they are not monogamous. They're not gonna stay together. They're gonna mate for a year and then move on from each other. The nesting of course will begin in the spring, like I said, but then the birds are going to move into a migratory pattern. And one more bird that I wanted to talk about that I thought was really, really neat was our red-winged blackbird. This is one that I get the chance to see in my yard. Those of you who don't live in an area associated with a river or a wetland, you may not get the chance to see this one very often. So a red-winged blackbird is really, really known for bold behavior confronted with threats. They're going to chase something off. The males have a really bright red patch on their wings that you saw in that last image, and they're very, very visible when they sing. They're going to forage on the ground or in trees usually in flocks during cooler months. And they're going to be nesting in marshy areas where they're going to attach their nest to marshy vegetation and wetlands. And of course, both males and females are gonna take care of the young and they're omnivorous, much like our robins and other birds that we talked about. Their nesting behavior is a little different. What they do is they construct a nest that's attached to different wetland plants, such as cattails, phragmites, goldenrod, et cetera. They're gonna make that wind that structure around those stiffer plants that are able to stand a little taller using string and other material to form a cup shape to put their eggs in. Now, due to habitat scarcity, red-winged blackbirds tend to nest in tight groups because, well, here in Indiana, we don't take the best care of our wetlands. So they're losing that habitat. And then the males and females are going to assist in defending that nest together. Since their habitat is so restricted, they're going to treat it very, very carefully. All right, so I, one, thing I, one last thing I wanted to talk about was the 2021 songbird disease outbreak. Um, a lot of you were hearing from DNR to please not put out bird baths or bird feeders. There was some kind of disease going around in our songbird species. So a lot of states actually reported this. We we're just one of many of them. The symptoms that birds dealt with were things that included swollen, crusty eyes, some neurological symptoms where the birds would act funny, and unfortunately, it usually led to death. They found that the species that were being affected by this included American robin, blue jay, brown-headed cowbird, common grackle, European starling, sparrows, finches, and the northern cardinal. So that covers a lot of ground. That means that a lot of our songbirds are being impacted by this disease that was often fatal. Now, when the outbreak started, we were asked by the Indiana Department of Natural Resources to please remove our bird feeders and bird baths so that way birds would not congregate and spread the disease amongst each other. With the help of Hoosiers, IDNR was able to identify 4,300 reports of sick or dead birds, and they confirmed 
uh, more than 750 possible cases across 76 counties, so a very significant portion of the state. So it was fairly widespread. The source of the disease was never determined. Um, it was determined that it was not avian influenza, which we had an outbreak of this year, um, and it also ruled out several other diseases. And unfortunately, that's just the way it goes sometimes. All right, before I jump to the end, though, uh, one thing I wanted to point out is just that thanks to us, we were able to help limit the spread of this disease, though. So please, if you want to continue to help out the IDNR, pay attention, go to their website, see if any alerts come up, and talk to your local extension offices, and we can keep you up to date if there's anything going on that we need to watch out for to protect our birds. All right, so with that, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, my office is open 8 to 4, Monday through Friday, at the two numbers you see below. You can also contact me by my email, also pictured there. I've also got a link to the Purdue Ed Store and the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab to help answer questions and find publications on the things that you are interested in. Uh, with that, I want to thank you for watching. And like I said, please feel free to reach out and contact me anytime.